asked to say a few words about the role of the laity in this year of mercy. And as I begin, I'd like to call your attention to our Lord in the tabernacle. The tabernacle is right in the center of the church, and it's easy to see where the Holy Eucharist is, and that's really the most important spot in the whole church. And on either side of the tabernacle, there's a vigil candle which is lit, telling us that the Lord's presence is here. And then right behind me is an elevated advent wreath. There are two candles that are lit, telling us that today is now the second Sunday of Advent. And it's a beautiful way to prepare for this wonderful feast of Christmas by having these feasts of the Blessed Mother early in Advent. Coming up in two days is the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. Two days after that is a little-known feast day of Our Lady, not really celebrated in this country, but it is in Italy. It's called Our Lady of Loretta. There's a little town on the east coast of Italy on the Adriatic uh, Sea that has the remains of the House of Nazareth. And then two days after that is the great feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe, which each year becomes even more important for us in this country. Not only is she the patroness of the Americas, North and South America, she's the patroness of all those who work on behalf of life, which is also the patroness of the new evangelization. And so there's kind of overlapping novenas this time of year. There's a novena going on right now to the map of conception, another novena that's starting for Our Lady of Guadalupe, and today is the second Sunday of Advent, but it's also St. Nicholas Day. And I don't know if you get any gold cover shot points, I do, it made me very, very happy. So some words about the role of the laity in this year of mercy, which we on Tuesday and goes until next November 20th, the Feast of Christ the King. The first question is, who are the laity? L-A-I-T-Y. Who are the laity? They're all baptized in the church who work in ordinary jobs throughout the world. They're teachers, they're doctors, they're engineers, they're carpenters, they're electricians, they're bus drivers, they're checkout receptionists, at the cleaners or the grocery store. Some of them coach football, some of them coach hockey, some of them jump out of planes with parachutes for I don't know what reason, but it's 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 just about everybody who's not included in the laity are the ordained clergy and religions. So deacons, priests, and bishops, and all of the religious, the brothers and sisters, whether they live an active life in the world or living that contemplative life of prayer. So it comes down to 99.9% of the baptized faithful are the laity. And so it's a very, very important part of the church. And so you're wondering today, well, what am I supposed to do during this year of mercy? And what am I supposed to do the year after the year of mercy? So I want to thank you for asking that question. Thank you for your interest in that question. Thank you for being here today. But I want to let you know you're not the first person to ask that question. What am I supposed to do now that I'm baptized? Years ago, about 2,000 years ago, there was a small group of Christians, just a couple hundred, like there are here today, and they lived in the second most important city in Greece. Just like Chicago is arguably the second most important city in this country. The name of that city was Thessalonica. It's still there today. It's a port city. It's central in Greece. It was important because of its position in the country and on the, and the Aegean Sea as a center of commerce, trade, and communication. Sounds like a Greek version of Chicago. Do you know more truck traffic goes in and out of Chicago and Gary and the other than any other artery in the country? Do you know more emails go through our telecommunication channels here in Chicago than any other city in the world? Do you know more people come in and out of O'Hare Airport than any other city in the world? And so Chicago is very much like Thessalonica was 2,000 years ago. And we're about the same number of Christians present here today 
that St. Paul addressed in the letter. And they were scratching their heads now that he had baptized them and evangelized them. What are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to do? And St. Paul writes in his first letter to the Thessalonians, For this is the will of God. In other words, this is what we're supposed to do. Here it is, two words. Your sanctification. That's what you're supposed to do. That's what I am supposed to do. We are supposed to become saints. That is what the Lord is calling us to do. To be a saint, like Saint Nicholas, who spent his life and his fortune helping out all sorts of people in need, without ever calling any attention to himself. He did it sort of secretly. And so we have that tradition in many Christian homes. Secret Santa. Somebody's done something for me, and they take no credit, because I don't know who it was. Who did that for me? What great kindness. He was generous, and he was hidden. Ultimately, sanctity comes down to this one thought. To be imitators of Christ. Because we call ourselves Christian. We are Catholic. But more broadly speaking, we are Christian. Which means of Christ. In Christ. With Christ. And that's why the greatest compliment anyone could ever give you. Or give me. Either to our face. Or better, behind our back, would be to say, Well, that was a very Christian thing to do. Or, Well, that was a very Christian thing to say. Maybe you've heard that comment before. People are sort of, it's a little bit ironic, right? Well, that's the whole point. Do Christian things, say Christian things, surprise people, inspire them. Delight them with being just like Jesus Christ where you are. And sometimes that means saying, please, you go first. In traffic, at the grocery store, at the movie theater, in conversation. And people will be surprised and delighted and inspired. Well, that was a very Christian thing to do. We can train ourselves in that exercise. Please, you go first. There are many, many situations where that arises. We have an opportunity to let people go first. The other day I was out for dinner and they passed a plate of Brussels sprouts and I said, please, you go first. <laughs> I'll wait till everybody is out their fair share. And if I don't get any, I'll just offer it up to God. <laughs> that takes effort to live as a Christian. To be imitators of Christ, to be holy, means to think with the mind of Christ. Praise Jesus, pray. Serve as Jesus served. And forgive as Jesus forgave. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. The Roman centurion standing by, observing that extraordinary display of mercy, said, this is the Son of God. That Roman centurion who had been around all the Mediterranean, who had seen hardship and brutality and violence and all the nasty side of life, had a wide experience with humanity, had never seen anything like that. He knew Jesus was innocent. And as he pounded the nails to his hand, he heard Jesus say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Truly, this man is the Son of God. That is a tall order to imitate Christ. But there's a process 
to grow and imitate Christ. Borrowing the insights of St. Josephine, he would say, Seek Christ, find Christ, love Christ. And when you begin to love Jesus, you will begin to imitate him. Where do we seek Jesus? In the Holy Eucharist. Where do we seek Jesus? In adoration. Where do we seek and find Jesus? By serving the poor, the lonely, and the forgotten, and the dying, and the marginalized. Where are they? 5,000 miles away? Certainly. Sometimes just five feet away. I love humanity. It's people I can't stand. I've heard that before. That's how we find Christ and seek Christ, in prayer, in the sacraments, and sacrifice. I'd like to offer for your reflection three stories about Jesus which speak to us about His mercy, and also speak to us about the attractiveness of goodness, truth, and beauty. And that's why these beautiful churches are so helpful in passing along the faith. They are inspire us. They're beautiful. They're an obvious testimony of faith and love and sacrifice. The first story about Jesus' mercy takes place in a busy crossroads in the Holy Land named Jericho. That was the name of the city. About 20 miles down the mountain from Jerusalem, on the main thoroughfare from Egypt to Mesopotamia. It's kind of like Gary, Indiana in the day. And there was a guy in that town named Zacchaeus, and he had been born, excuse me, and there was a guy in the town named Zacchaeus, and he was a publican, he was a tax collector. So he was Jewish, but he was working for the Romans. And the way it worked is the more taxes collected, the more he made. And so his fellow countrymen, the Jewish people, despised him. And the Romans mocked him. And so he isolated himself. Nobody could stand him. And one day Jesus comes into Jericho where the crowds turn out. They've heard all about him. They want to see him. They want to touch him. And here comes Zacchaeus, the publican, the tax collector. He hears the commotion, and in his heart, he wants to see Jesus too. But he's short of stature, he can't see, and he's pushing his way through the crowd, and people are saying, Zacchaeus, what are you doing here? Like, the Messiah doesn't want to see you. I mean, you're such a lost, just boo, Zacchaeus. It doesn't say that in the gospel, but that's what's going on. He runs up ahead, he climbs a sycamore tree. Imagine the wealthiest guy in the town up there like a monkey in the tree. And as Jesus walks by, he looks up in the tree. He says one word. Just one word. He says, Zacchaeus! And when Jesus saw him, and he knew that Jesus was the Messiah, and knew all about him, and Jesus called out to him with love, saying, Zacchaeus! Like my love! His heart was changed in that moment. And he came down and said, Lord, if I've defrauded anybody, I'm going to pay him back fourfold. Behold, I give half of everything I own to the poor. What a great conversion. That's goodness in the voice of Jesus. He knew all about Zacchaeus. He knew all about him. And we never hear Zacchaeus again. And I think the reason is because he went out and got two or three jobs to pay off his commitment. <laughs> that can be a lesson for us this year. No matter who we meet, no matter what we know about the person, approach them with that goodness in our voice like they are a long lost friend. It opens the gate for conversion. The second story, which teaches us so much about the mercy of Jesus and how he uses truth to help people is 
It's a story about the woman who is caught in adultery. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees drag her through the street like they've got a trophy. They absolutely humiliate that poor woman. They shame her. They throw her at the feet of Jesus. They put him on the spot. So, Master, Moses told us that we should stone such people. What do you say? They think they've got a call. Because if Jesus says, yeah, go ahead and stone her, well, that's really harsh. And if Jesus said, well, don't pay any attention to Moses, they said, well, you're a heretic. They think they got it. They think they're on the side of truth. But they're certainly not on the side of mercy. And our Lord bends down and he starts doodling in the ground. And they press him on the point. And finally Jesus says, okay, all right, go ahead, stone her. We'll go in order. We'll start with a person who has no sin. You be the first. They lower their heads. And one by one, they silently drift away, beginning with the elders. You see, Jesus spoke truth there. Whoever has no sin, you can condemn others. There's truth in it. Finally, he speaks to the woman and says, Nobody condemned you. Poor thing. Somehow she found a voice, she said, No one, no one. Well, I don't condemn you. Go your way. But sin no more. Just part of truth. He's a good teacher. The Ten Commandments of God has given us are a gift. They make a lot of sense. We strive to live according to the Ten Commandments. We find joy and peace and fruitfulness in our life. They make us more free. The teachings of our Holy Mother Church are a gift. Part of her mercy. And the third story speaks to us about the beauty of God's mercy. It takes place on Easter night, the night of the resurrection. The apostles are in the upper room. They haven't seen Jesus for three days. Last they were with him was on Holy Thursday. When he needed them the most, they were gone. He spent three years with them. Day in, day out, sleeping out of the stars and working with them, feeding with them, teaching them, encouraging them, serving them. And at one time he needed their help. They weren't there. They were not there in the plaza on the morning of Good Friday to speak up for him. They weren't there as he carried the cross. They weren't there as he hung upon the cross with the exception of St. John. They had heard rumors that Jesus had risen from the dead. Their minds and their hearts were filled with all sorts of disappointment, shame, guilt, conflict. Gosh, if we had a second chance, we'd be there on Good Friday. Gosh, if we had a second chance, I'd be courageous and I'd make sure they didn't nail him to the cross. All those thoughts that go through our head, give me a second chance. I can be a better person.
It's truly beautiful how our Lord doesn't bring up their defects at all. Does not correct them. He changes the subject. You have something to eat. Peace be with you. Whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven. What a great moment to institute the sacrament of confession, penance, reconciliation. From then on, they would always think, well, we got off scot free. I have to give other people that same grace. The pages of the New Testament are filled with signs of our Lord's mercy. We are called to be like Jesus Christ. To the others. Someone may forget you on your birthday. Someone may forget you on Christmas. Someone may forget you on an important day. Do we have the mercy and the grace to let it go? That will be impossible without God. But if we look at Jesus upon the cross, then we can. I just reread an article by Cardinal George from about a year ago. And he told the story that when he was 13 years old and came down with polio, a man in the neighborhood came to visit him told him that his daughter also had polio and could he see his leg. And so 13-year-old Francis George showed him his leg and the guy looked at it, felt it, and then looked Francis George in the eye and said, it's pretty bad, but my daughter's both legs are much worse. So look, Francis George, don't go through your life feeling sorry for yourself. Cardinal George wrote, that's the best advice I ever got. As I realized as a youngster, somebody always has it worse off than I do. That's a very liberating thought. You didn't get even? Well, that's a very Christian thing to do. You didn't get upset? That's a very Christian thing to do. You didn't talk back? It was a very Christian thing to do. Some years ago, I was a chaplain at a boys' camp. There was a little boy there, 11 or 12 years old. He was there from Spain for the summer. And the first four days of camp, it was rainy and cold. It was muddy and miserable. And this kid was homesick and he was miserable. And all the counselors tried to console him. Finally, they brought to the man the boy to me, the little Jose, to speak to the chap. And I heard his tale of woe. I couldn't understand he was homesick and the weather was miserable. So I thought I'd give him a supernatural explanation. I said, Jose, you believe in Jesus, don't you? Yeah. Do you remember Jesus on the cross, the nails in his hands, the crown of thorns on his head, the ashes in his back, the terrible sufferings? I said, Jose, is your situation here at camp right now worse than Jesus had it on the cross? And he got very thoughtful and raised his head. And then he looked up and said, You bet it is. <laughs> That's an 11 year old boy. We expect that from youngsters. But if a person says, Honestly, no, no, it's not even close. That's the reaction of an adult who's grown. Now, the next day the sun came out, he scored three goals and was happy as can be. But isn't it true we can feel sorry for ourselves? Oh, I admit, it is a challenge. And without God's grace, none of this is possible. And so during this year of mercy, let's really live as Christians, let's let go of the grudges. Let's let go of resentments. Ask yourself, is there anyone in your life you refuse to speak to? That takes too much energy to hold on to that. 
You never find peace or joy or freedom. You rest. And let it go. Let it go. We'll find that grace through humble contrition and confession. We'll find that grace by going to the Blessed Mother. We'll find that grace by going to the Lord and the Holy Eucharist. So let's be 100% behind Pope Francis and the Spirit of the Holy Spirit this year of mercy to live as merciful people towards others and proclaim that mercy to God. Now let's finish by praying the memorari. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who has a lack of protection, or who are in the hell, or sought by the intercession of the Lord of the inspired by his confidence, and by his name, O Virgin of the Lord of the Lord, to thee I come, O Lord of the Lord, and sinful and sorrowful, O Mother of the Lord of the Lord, despise not my petitions, but in your mercy, and in your mercy, now let us pause and 